You are now listening to the Counterflow Podcast, a place for dissonant voices and unapproved opinions. You get split in half, cause I call the hologram wrath, but I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast, rhythmically equivalent of solids, liquid and gas. We smash your sinus with the power of Lord Titus, but I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Here is your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson. What's up, you guys? Welcome back once again to the Counterflow Podcast. As always, I am your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson, coming to you out of Lockhart, Texas. I'm so excited about this episode. It's touching upon a lot of current events, a lot of bad theology, and we're going to clarify it through the teachings of the Orthodox Church. My friend Nicholas is back on the show from Orthodox Reflections. He's always a good guest. He's got a lot of wisdom to impart on us. And we're talking about this article over at Orthodox Reflections called Red States Are Lurching Toward the Antichrist. And a lot of it deals with Zionism. Uh, A lot of it, of course, Zionism is being pushed in the name of Christianity, but it's some really dangerous stuff. There's a lot of anti-free speech laws being pushed in the name of pushing against anti-Semitism, which is becoming quite the useless word, quite the meaningless word, that is, because it's labeling a lot of things that are actually good as anti-Semitic. As my spiritual father, Father Turbo, said, you cannot be an Orthodox Christian and be a Zionist. Well, I was told recently by a rabbi that if you're against Zionism, you're anti-Semitic. See, there's a lot going on here. And Nicholas from Orthodox Reflections is here to bring the nuance, the truth, and push through a lot of the propaganda and anti-free speech laws and whatnot. What's going on with the red heifers? What about the red heifers? What's going on with that? Orthodox Reflections is a collaborative effort by committed Orthodox Christians to provide thoughtful analysis of the Orthodox Christian faith's interaction with American culture. That is a perfect way to sum up what Nicholas is here to do. We're cutting through the propaganda and explaining the evils of Zionism, what's going on, why is this happening in the name of Christianity. Welcome back to the show, Nicholas from Orthodox Reflections. How are you, sir? Hey, doing well, Buck. How are you doing today, buddy? I'm good. I'm good. Looking handsome as always. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah, I mean you, not me. Um, <laughs> So I guess uh, I always feel weird having people do an intro when they've been on before, but I, like Mm -hmm. I always say, these shows get picked up in algorithms and people doing searches, especially hopefully for this topic uh, we're talking about today. So Mm -hmm. um, maybe someone sees this, they don't know who you are, what Orthodox Reflections is, who I am. So I'll let you give an intro and what you guys do over there at OR, and then we'll jump into the piece. Great. So orthodoxreflections.com, uh, we, have, we are a group blog. And so we publish writing uh, from a variety of different individuals who are coming from the Orthodox faith perspective, but they're looking at uh, mostly contemporary culture, contemporary uh, issues within the Orthodox Church, global issues, and as well as everything going on within an American society. We're primarily Americans, but we do have some Canadians as well as some Brits that contribute as well. So we get kind of an international flavor going on. And um, orthodoxreflections.com, come by and check it out. And I, I think it's fair to say because of, let's say some of the topics you guys discuss, uh, it, it's, it can be, but it's not always somewhat, um, let's say you don't want to dox yourselves, which is why you're uh, not showing your face. Is, would, you, uh, would, would you say that's accurate? Well, that's 100% accurate. So we, right now, I would say probably about 50-50, about half of our contributors actually are in positions either because they're retired, they're self-employed, they're clergy with uh, one of the more traditionalist uh, jurisdictions within orthodoxy, can't go fully with their name. So about 50% easy. We, uh, But the rest, like for example, I write under my uh, baptismal name, Nicholas, uh, because I work for a company that is a Fortune 500 woke monster. And um, I won't narrow it down any further than that, but just the fact that uh, I talk about the Orthodox Church's stance, for example, on 
homosexuality or on abortion would be enough that my HR department would uh, uh, right. absolutely not care that I do this on my own time. They would not care that I am not representing them. The mere fact that I work for them would be enough that off we go. And I'm wow. not the only one in that position. So just just to give you a couple couple heads up, when we had a uh, real way back at the beginning of uh, the pandemic, we had an Orthodox medical researcher uh, take issue with the inflated claims of efficacy that were being put out. Well, he got investigated by his state's medical board, and they tried to take his license away. Wow. Uh, we had an, a Canadian physician that wrote about the link between the mRNA jabs and uh, abortion. She also got investigated. She actually teaches at a university, and they tried to take away her teaching position. They tried to take away her medical license. So this is real. Cancel culture is real, and that actually kind of leads into the topic that we're yes, going to be discussing today because cancel culture is now going bipartisan. Yes, indeed. Yeah, let's jump into it. I Will you, in fairness, this is a... I, Immediately, as soon as I read this piece, I reached out to you and said, I need to get in touch with the author. Do you mm -hmm. want to give his name and, and, and I don't know, up front, just to give him credit for this piece? He said, he was a very uh, kind gentleman, Southern gentleman, if you will, mm -hmm. and said, mm -hmm. look, Buck, I, I'm not a podcast kind of guy. I don't want to come on. I'm not, I don't have a setup, et cetera. Sure. So it's Walt Garlington and he's uh, got his own, got his own website. So if you visit the site and, and uh, look at the piece and we not only attribute this to Walt, but we also uh, have a link to his website, which is called uh, Confederate Confederate, a Southern perspective. So he's a, he's a great guy. We have uh, quite a number of his articles on the site. Look forward to every contribution we get from him. Excellent. All right. And so I said, well, if he's not going to do it, Nicholas, would you come on? I know you know stuff about this this topic and you were kind enough to do that. So I would start off, I kept, as I'm reading the piece, um, friend of the show and friend of mine, Father John Whiteford, uh, mm -hmm. also slammed <laughs> in, in, in a recent hit piece. Um, mm -hmm. He says, bad theology leads to bad actions. And I kept thinking that as I'm reading mm -hmm. this piece. And so I guess we'll start by... Uh, I mean, I, I think that kind of overlays the entire theme of it, but uh, what's going on in these red states uh, with the anti, quote unquote, anti-Semitic speech laws kind of, I guess we'll jump into it on that topic. Sure. Well, what's going on is, uh, let me level set this by saying there's among conservatives, there is this idea that if the red states could simply secede, if the red states could be free that we could solve our problems. And the topic we're discussing today illustrates that that's not really the case. Here in the red states, we are simultaneously living side by side. We're, we're living side by side with people who are of a, typically of a Christian Zionist persuasion. That's the, the bulk of them, but also individuals that simply um, uh, have a incomplete view of history and believe the narrative that Jews are always victims. Jews are the eternal victim. And that's how it's been presented. That's how Christian Zionism presents it, but that's also how a lot of mainstream believe. And Christian Zionists are a very potent voting bloc. And of course, they're supported by APAC and propped up by APAC. That's the uh, uh, Israel's lobbying arm within the United States. But here in these red states, what's happening, it's up in South Dakota, it's happening in Georgia, and it's accelerating now in Florida because our own governor DeSantis just announced that any yeah. student that has giving anti-Semitic uh, comments or engaging in protest behavior against Israel is out of the university system. He announced that yesterday. We've seen, so there's there's a Christian Zionist aspect of this. There's this kind of the general, you know, predisposition within red state society to to be kind towards Jews because of the historic historic oppression that they've suffered. But this is extraordinarily dangerous because the, I guess one way to say this would be in the old days, anti-Semitism was you didn't like Jews. In the modern world. Anti-Semitism means that you're engaging in something that Jews don't like. Correct. And so that's where we're at. So if you 
are going to protest, for example, what's going on in Gaza. That's pretty much face anti-Semitic. You, you're not going to be allowed to do that. You're not going to be allowed to protest Soros because Soros is, is yep. Jewish. So if you call out a specific Jew, if you say that uh, we have too many, too many rabbinic Jews represented in the power structure within the Biden administration, anti-Semitic right there, they're going to shut you down. They're going to deplatform you and you're going to be canceled. And this is not just the left. The left was doing that over, over things like homosexuality and uh, climate change. Well, now the right is joining in by saying, you know, you cannot criticize an entire religion or anyone associated with that religion or a state which confesses that religion, which we're giving $27 billion to. Right. We can't even question where our money's going now. Yeah, I, I, I was uh, told, I've been told you can't harshly discuss neo con, neo uh neo conservatives for the same it's <laughs> right. it's like well there's some weird like tacit admission in in that that what who backs that movement i guess and right. then i saw i i never thought much of of Candace owens to be to be quite frank I, not neither good nor bad i just didn't think much of her and mm -hmm. then i saw her recently debating this rabbi that seemed like a real slimy used car salesman right and right. he the, says the, the rabbi whose daughter runs a, a, a sex toy company yeah it wasn't that guy it was his friend or something oh okay um, but it was that was that stuff was brought up of course and he said now uh if you're anti-zionist you're anti-semitic and i thought well my own spiritual father says quite famously you can't be orthodox and and be a zionist and so i'm starting to equate all these and it's like well does that label us with this term i suppose mm -hmm. um it, it's one of these um meaning it's, it's it's starting to fall into what i call um meaningless words um like sexism or you know they just start using it so broadly that it loses its meaning it's it's, it's on one hand it's a clever play for them to to blanket everyone who doesn't agree with them as this or that. But on the other hand, then the term loses any punch or meaning. Uh, and well, then, except that it's backed up by law. That's I mean, that's where we get into this. Yeah, and, so and you're a lot of money. Right. You're you're 100 percent right. Anti anti semitism doesn't mean anything anymore. Really, it's been drained of all meaning. Because, for example, as you're you're 100 percent correct, the Orthodox Church says the church is Israel. You, yes. The secular nation, the secular run nation, which is increasingly sliding into Zionist fundamentalism in the Middle East is not Israel. The church is Israel. Well, now that's anti-Semitic now. Mm. Christian theology, Orthodox yes. Christian theology is now anti-Semitic because it's called supersessionism. We, we are the true continuation of Israel. We're at, okay, now that's anti-Semitic. And so Am I going to be deplatformed for just saying that because that is orthodox theology? Right. Yeah, that's that's the issue here. What is we I mean, we might as well discuss the term dispensationalism because I do believe that has a lot to do with what's going on here and and mm -hmm. and it's a term I, some people are familiar with, some people just hear it. What 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 does that word mean? So it's a set of Christian theology that says that we have been through multiple dispensations in history, the dispensation of law, the dispensation of grace, that these are discrete times in that you can track through the Bible of God dealing with the human race and with, with Israel. So one of the keys, and, and dispensationalism disagrees with itself on a lot of points of eschatology, how the world is going to end. But let's just take kind of the, the middle of the road mostly they're millennialists, which means that they believe that Jesus Christ is going to return and that he is going to reign for a thousand years from Jerusalem. That after that kingdom, then Satan will be loosed and, and trick the nations and then there will be the final close of the age. But they firmly believe that Christ is going to return and reign from Jerusalem. So you've probably heard Pastor John Hagee say this. And so there's also the rapture component. Okay, we're all going to get out. 
then there's going to be the Antichrist, and then Christ will return and he'll reign for a thousand years. Dispensationalism is is really recent and it was, of course, pushed by the Schofield Bible. So when you were per- going out giving everyone a Bible, and that Bible has footnotes which indicate that um you know, for example, that Jews can be sa- are still in a covenant relationship with God, and that the Jews are going to be all saved by virtue of being Jews. And if it's all in the Bible as footnotes, then you're going to accept it, and that's really what happened. So Christian Zionists believe that the refounding of the state of Israel in the 1940s was a pivotal event leading to the end times. That Christ Himself is going to come down and reign from Jerusalem. And we as Orthodox Christians believe that the Antichrist, anti not meaning a meaning in place of, right, anti, right. You know, well, we believe that Christ is going, the Antichrist is going to reign from Jerusalem. So we believe that all of what's being done, the potential to uh, actually erect this third temple in uh, Jerusalem, all of this is being preparatory to the antichrist not christ we don't believe christ is going to reign for a thousand years christ is already reigning this is the millennial kingdom now the church age because we affirm in the nicene creed his kingdom will have no end once christ returns everyone is going to see him everywhere around the world he's not just going to come down and land in jerusalem take up residence in a rebuilt temple and start ruling as a temporal king for a thousand years. This also has to do with, and we should probably touch on this too, even though some people are going to deem it anti-Semitic, I suppose, but <laughs> I grew up, you mentioned Hagee, mm-hmm. uh, and I've said this several times on this show that that was the church I was attending uh, when mm-hmm. I was in high school, ironically enough, and now I'm putting out episodes against what he was uh, preaching, but the God, Jews are God's chosen people. Uh, where does that come from? That That's a large part of these laws that are happening, I, I think, mm-hmm. is that some, I don't know, it's always this battle, like, do these governors believe that? Are they getting funded to say they believe that? I don't know. It doesn't matter because the end mm-hmm. result is that these laws are coming up. But where does this mm-hmm. idea that Jews are God's chosen people come from, and how is it viewed from the Orthodox Church? Sure. Well, I'm in the... Well, in the the press releases, when they're making decisions or passing these laws, the governors do reference the Jews as God chosen people. So whether they believe it or whether they're paid to believe it, yeah. either way, that's End what's result. being put out. Yeah. Right. So where does where does God's chosen people come from? Well, well, because the Bible, you're reading the Bible, and you're reading the Old Testament, and you believe that the Old Testament covenant is still in effect. Because you've been taught that. Now, that is a post-16th century uh, doctrine. That is not the historical doctrine of the church. If it was the historical doctrine of the church, then why would the Jews who converted to Christianity go around preaching Christianity to other Jews, converting them? Why do you have a book called Hebrews whose whole purpose is to convince Hebrews to become Christian? Yes. We, we We wouldn't have even started because we started, of course— as a as a movement among Jews who believed that Jesus was the promised one, the Messiah, he was actually God, and he had come down and off off to go preaching. But it's it's really you take a bunch of people who are not within the historic church; they don't have any guidance, and they're making up a religion as they go along in the 16th, 17th, 18th century. And they came, and and it was guided as well. There was money from Jewish sources that went into building the dispensational movement, the Christian Zionist movement. And they were kind of guided along this path that the Bible, the Bible's promises to the Jews are eternal, even though those aren't actually the Jews. If you look at the history of it, the, the uh, second temple was destroyed in AD 70. From that moment on, the Mosaic religion could not be practiced. The religion of the day when Christ was walking this earth was based on a cult of animal sacrifice. Sacrifices went away after AD 70. What we know today is Judaism 
was crafted together over the course of a few hundred years, starting around AD 100, and it stems from the Pharisaic tradition. Yes. We all remember that Christ was not a big fan of the Pharisees. (laughs) So from an Orthodox perspective, this is a new religion. We're the continuation of Israel. We have sacrifice. We are a sacerdotal religion that's based around the sacrifice of the Eucharist. Whereas the Jews, rabbinic, Jew, rabbinic Judaism is not. It is all based around study, prayer, adherence to law. But it, those things arose because they could no longer sacrifice animals. But they want, there is a serious movement within Judaism that does want to bring back the temple and bring back the animal sacrifices because they realize that their religion is not the religion of Moses. It can't be because it's lacking in that cultic sacrifice, sacrificial element. Mm -hmm. But Christians are really, the Christian Zionists are really dogmatic on this. You know, they quote Genesis, you know, that uh, I will bless those who bless you and and, uh, punish those um, who hurt you. They are very fixated on this idea and to the point to where it's it's in many of these dispensationalist churches, it's dual covenant theology. Whereas Mm -hmm. the Jews can be saved by being good Jews. Mm -hmm. Christians must have Christ. Yeah. The the fascinating thing is that there are some people who would fall under the blanket term Christian Zionists that profess their knowledge of the Bible. And it, it parts of this feels like maybe there's, they're either skipping something or they forgot like part two, if you will. Um, does, that, does that make sense? Oh, it makes 100% sense. Yeah, dispensationalism takes, cuts verses out of Daniel, cuts verses out of Isaiah. It stitches verses together all over the place within the Bible in order to come up with this idea, this kind of timeline for salvation. And uh, it's, you know, it, it's not reading the Bible in context it's not reading the Bible through the, mm. the historical lens of the church. It's very, very much just kind of uh, exactly what you said. We're going to take these parts that we like, and we're going to ignore these other parts that, that we don't like. And I, I deal with that. We deal with that all the time when talking to Protestants. But it, for the most part, you know, if you're arguing over sola scriptura, for example, no one's going to get arrested for that. Correct. But if you look at what's happening now, so now if we challenge the claims about the Jews being God's chosen people, if we challenge the claims that Israel is the true Israel as opposed to the church, if we do that in public, um, what are we facing? You know, you see what's happening with the anti-Israeli protests on the college campuses. Some mm-hmm. of these kids are getting out of line. But I was just watching a, a video this morning about a uh, – the professor, there was a professor at Emory who was just standing there, a female professor even, two big cops wrestle her to the ground, put their knee right in her back. She's screaming, I'm a professor, I'm a professor. She had taken no aggressive action to the police. She was probably 130 pounds soaking wet. Mm. And they, they beat that woman. And this is what, you can, what we're going to be up against. So unlike regular arguments with Protestants, this is the potential to be highly weaponized against us. And if you start to combine this with some other topics we've talked about, like central bank digital currency, mm. uh, at what point do they simply say, okay, um, you guys are anti-Semitic, so you can't, we, you can't donate money to the church. You Correct. can't donate money to the parish. Yes. Oh, you're, you're anti-Semitic, so we're going to de-platform you and, and shut down your website. Yes, right, right. It, another thing I think that ties into some of the things you just said uh, the term Judeo-Christian, another term I have grew up hearing, of course, that it's just, mm-hmm. it's, I heard it so often that it's just a term. It just is what it is, mm-hmm. but it isn't. <laughs> I, as I've learned uh, since becoming Orthodox, can you talk about that specific f- term and, and maybe why it's used and then what's incorrect about it? So I, I think that the reason it's used is because you're trying to Put us all on the same side from a PR perspective. Yeah, you know, we're we're intimately linked. You know, we're the we're all Abrahamic religions, right? We're, we right. all follow an Abrahamic faith, and we have this common uh, morality 
We have a common history together in the Old Testament. And so we're all on the same side against those nasty atheists or nasty Muslims or, mm-hmm. or whoever else. So it's kind of an enforced teaming in my, in my, my way of thinking. Mm-hmm. What's wrong with that is, is simply, as I mentioned, the modern Judaism is not the faith of the Old Testament. It was made up by rabbis in order to replace the religion that was destroyed in AD 70, a religion that Christ prophesied would be destroyed and was replaced with Christianity. So we, everything that was good in the Old Testament, everything that was good in the synagogue, everything that was good in the temple, and we consciously, we consciously brought synagogal worship. That's where our liturgy is patterned after that plus the temple. We consciously, the, the, our Christian forebears in Orthodoxy, consciously brought everything that was good and wholesome that had been handed down within Israel, within mm-hmm. uh, Judea. They brought that into the Orthodox faith. So it's all there already. Mm-hmm. We don't need the rabbinic Jews to tell us about the Ten Commandments. We have the Ten Commandments. We have the temple worship. The synagogue worship, that's all part of our Orthodox worship every Sunday in the Divine Liturgy. Yeah, that's part of how our churches are set up on the inside. Mm-hmm. Even my small little country Orthodox <laughs> church, some of the way uh, the iconostasis and, and parts of it are set up or, or modeled after the temple worship. Am I, am I correct in that? Yeah, oh, 100%. 100%. We are consciously a continuation of, of Old Testament practices, of Israel and the Hebrews, whatever term we want to use, we are consciously continuing that, both in our liturgy, in our in the way that we structure our space. So we are not in any way incomplete. We don't need anything from rabbinic Jews. And in fact, the truth is we're intimately opposed to rabbinic Judaism. If you look at the Talmud, for example, and the things that are in the Talmud about Christ yes. boiling in feces. If you think about the fact that the rabbinic Jews actually consciously reject Christ. Yes. This is not something that's just kind of out there. They consciously reject Christ in their writings, in the readings that are done in the synagogue, in the Talmud. It is a conscious rejection of Christ. So how in the world can we be on the same side when you fundamentally hate our God? Yes. Yes, and Lord have mercy, his mother too, the, the, the stuff that is said about Mary uh, is... It's awful. awful. Yeah. But, but unfortunately, you know, when it comes to Mary, many of our Protestant brethren have adopted those same Flanders. They say horrible things about Mary. Mm-hmm. Who is this past... The, 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 well, I should say, we, in this article, and I've already kind of alluded to this, mentions John Hagee. So let me ask about him really quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, <laughs> I've had about enough of this guy in my life. Through, mm-hmm. <laughs> through, but, but his name does keep coming up. I, I think I would say he's the most powerful non-politician mouthpiece for Zionism. Uh, mm-hmm. What does his movement, for those who don't know who he is, what does his movement represent? Well, there's what it actually represents and what he tries to represent it as. So mm-hmm. what he tries to represent it as is authentic Christianity. You know, good morals. And that's another problem with when we talk about red states. I mean, we, we think, okay, we're, the, we're the, the arbiters of good morals. You know, we're, we're against all the sins. Uh, we're trying to make a more uh, harmonious and peaceful society. You know, my father follows John Hagee. And less about the Zionism, but more about, you know, the hard old school preaching about, yeah. about, you know, accept Jesus as your personal savior and follow, you know, follow the right path and avoid sin and all that. So he, he's less about the politics. And that's yes. one of the reasons why Hagee is very powerful is because he does hit all those old timey preacher, he does. you know, the old time gospel hour. He's got that. But Hagee is a Judaizer. What Hagee is doing consciously is he's bringing in rabbinic Judaism into Christianity and he's melding the two together. So he will, you'll see him wearing the prayer shawls. You'll see him doing uh, Jewish, uh, like a Jewish Passover, for example. I've seen him uh, do that before. He will have his choir sing in Hebrew. And one of the things we have to think about with the Antichrist, our 
Orthodox tradition says that the Antichrist is going to be highly regarded among the Jews. He will be accepted. He will most likely be a Jew himself. And that he is going to oppose Orthodox practices. And he is going to encourage Judaizing. So that means worship on Saturday. Well, we already have Protestant cults that worship on Saturday, like the Seventh-day Adventists. He is going to encourage everyone to be, or mandate, potentially mandate, everyone be circumcised. He is going to mandate that instead of, for example, the Orthodox Church claiming to be the true Israel, that we have to recognize Israel as Israel. So he'll mandate Zionism. So we, for example, our Eucharist, you know, is our Eucharist, because it's the body and blood of Christ who was killed by the Romans on behalf of the Jews, is the Eucharist now anti-Semitic? And so, if so, can we oppress the Eucharist so that we change orthodoxy from being sacerdotal to now being exactly what John Hagee is, which is a pep rally for Jesus with a speech at the end? Is that how we are going to have, uh, is that how the legal system is going to work? But Hagee has so much influence in Washington because he runs just an awesome lobbying campaign. And he will never change. He is absolutely convinced that he needs to bring forth the Antichrist that he, and that everything going on in Israel is an answer to prophecy, even though he has to revise those answers periodically. Mm-hmm. But this is, he, his faith is rock solid in Israel. Mm-hmm. And his interpretation of the Bible, his interpretations of Revelations, you will never dissuade the man. And he is very, very powerful. He is. He was, uh, some of the things he does, I would call atheist, atheist, like his church to me is an atheist factory. There's certain churches that are, that push people out. And it's like the irony of him being big and like you do the right thing, be moral. He backed, mm-hmm. he backed uh, John McCain. It's like he, the, one of the most murder-hungry politicians in my lifetime. At the, you know, it's like, but where does the Christianity fit into, you know, slaughtering millions of people? I, I don't know. But again, I guess there's not enough people asking these questions. And who is this? A name I was not familiar with. It's in the article. Pastor Doug Wilson of Idaho. Who, who is what does he do? What's, what's, what's this about? Well, so he was just on Tucker. Uh, so uh, Doug Wilson was the preacher that was on Tucker uh, talking about Christian nationalism. Oh, my. Okay. Okay. So Doug Wilson, so he's mentioned in the article, uh, not positively, by the way, just in case right. anybody's curious, but he was mentioned as an additional example of even someone who is trying to say, okay, we're... Um, we're pro-America. We're America first. Um, you know, we're trying to preserve traditional, I think he's more Calvinist in his, oh, okay. in his theology. Even though we're trying to preserve traditional Calvinist theology, even he brings in uh, Judaizing tendencies as well. And so that was what the, the discussion was about that. But yeah, Doug Wilson is not prominent in this particular article, but he has exploded onto the scene now, as well as the, the whole Christian nationalist movement. The basic primer for Christian nationalism was published by his publishing house out of Moscow, Idaho. Mm. There's uh, various uh, people who track Doug Wilson uh, on Twitter. There's uh, an entire Twitter account that's dedicated to tracking him. So I'm just now starting to learn about Doug Wilson. I'm just now starting to learn about Christian nationalism. It is, Mm -hmm. as I mentioned, it's Calvinist based. So it is completely heretical from a standpoint of orthodoxy. We can't support it. It has a lot of loopy ideas. We already have our own political philosophy within orthodoxy called symphonia, Mm -hmm. the idea that the church and state should cooperate for the betterment of society, but each should stay in their lane. Mm -hmm. Okay? So the the church is not going to become a political institution, and the political institutions should not be managing the church, but they can cooperate together. Mm -hmm. So we already have 2,000 years of history to draw from. 1700 of that with Christian kingdoms and polities of various sizes. So we don't need Doug Wilson's advice on, Mm -hmm. on how to run a country. We're, we're cool on that, Doug. We're Mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, even it's so difficult with Protestantism 
every flavor of it, it is so difficult not to fall into Gnosticism and not to fall into Judaizing because you, you're just, it's a totally mental face. It's completely all about study and it's completely all about uh, prayers and then the liturgy, they don't have it. So they go to church and you sing songs that are in, you know, it's just the same as what you would hear on a Christian radio station. They basically sing pop music. Mm-hmm. And then you you listen to the pastor and it's whatever the pastor is saying mm-hmm. is what they're believing. There is no other source. I mean, can you imagine if you're in orthodoxy, you're going through the divine liturgy, you get to the end and the pastor pops up, the, our priest pops up to give a homily and he says, Christ isn't God. Mm. Okay, Christ isn't God. Christ was uh, just a really nice guy. Mm-hmm. You just spent the past two hours praying to Jesus as God in the liturgy. It's mm-hmm. not going to work. But they, maintaining doctrinal, uh, doctrinal solidity when you've got everything focused on what one man says for 45 minutes at the end of a pep rally is very difficult. Right. It's been said many times, and this isn't totally possible because we're human, but the priest should be able, within orthodoxy, you should be able to remove a priest, put another one in, and you're not getting much different. Of course, you know, everyone has their own personality, but it, to your point, it's not like, well, my priest says this and he's different. And it's like, mm-hmm. no, you're orthodox priest. And you know, our homilies are short. It's not like a big pep rally, like you say, but uh, mm-hmm. uh, let's jump to this. This is one of the, the this sp- specific issues, something that I really want to hit on and why mm-hmm. I wanted this to discuss this article. I just heard about the red heifer thing mm-hmm. from a friend, I would say eight months ago or something like that. And he mentioned it. And it's like, once you learn something, you start seeing it everywhere. Mm-hmm. What on earth is this red heifer thing about? Uh, what is it? And then what's happening with it at the moment and, and why? So the red heifer is the thinking is that these perfect unblemished red heifers are going to be the initial sacrifice that is going to bring back temple sacrifice. We're going to reintroduce temple sacrifice into, into Judaism. So these red heifers were grown by a Texas Protestant rancher. And um, they were sent to Israel, cost him, I think, around $500,000 total to transfer them over. They were hoping that they were going to sacrifice them over uh, Passover here, 2024, just a few days ago. As far as I can tell, it did not happen. Now, I don't know why it didn't happen. The red heifers are there. They've got them in Israel. The rabbis are that are controlling them are absolutely committed to bringing back temple sacrifice. Now, did they not sacrifice the red heifers because they don't have the temple rebuilt yet? Mm. Or did they not sacrifice them because that would be potentially even more provocative uh, given the fact that they're already committing genocide in Gaza? Mm. Now you're, you're adding more fuel to this because now it becomes very clear that you're trying to reestablish temple sacrifice and all that that entails. I don't know. I'm not sure why mm. this didn't occur. But what's really funny though, is if you look at this guy, so the, the rancher that did this, when he was asked why he did it, I'm, I'm just going to quote this from the, the article. Why search for a cow? An excerpt from this rancher's uh, website read, these red heifers can bring world peace. The Bible teaches us that the key for building the third temple, the house of prayer for all nations is purifying us with the red heifer in Jerusalem. Okay, so, wow. This is a global one world religion. So this guy thinks he's a Christian. He's, he identifies as Protestant, but he's talking about rebuilding a house of prayer for all nations. So a pan world one world religion. And sounds familiar. It sounds very familiar. Um, but you think about where the ecumenical movement is right now that is being pushed, even in the Orthodox, Orthodox Church. Yes. Many pass to God, according to Archbishop El Pitaforos. There's many pass up the mountain. So even within Orthodoxy, we have those that are pushing the idea that we can all blend all religions harmoniously. In Dubai, they built the, the house of prayer that has... Uh, sections for all four of the major world religions to be able to pray in. And this is, this is where we're, 
where we're going. So if you can't criticize the processes that are coming together to give you the Antichrist, if the Antichrist is Jewish and you can't criticize the Antichrist when he begins to make his appearance, if you're not allowed to practice the Orthodox faith fully, then you have just handed the world to the Antichrist. Where's his opposition going to be? Who is going to be telling the truth? We're all going to be in catacombs preaching uh, to each other because we're not going to be able to openly openly oppose. They, they'll take away our platform, take away our money. And under the guise of Antichrist, I don't know how to frame this question correctly. The state of Israel as it is now, is it holy land? Is it biblical? What? Because you, you alluded to that, that Christian Zionists think that the, as it was established in 48, 1948, I believe, that mm-hmm. that is some step towards something. Mm-hmm. What, what is holy about that specific piece of land, if, if it is at all? Well, the land itself. Absolutely, it's holy. I mean, that's where Christ walked. Okay. That's, that's where Christ was born. That's where Christ was crucified. That's where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is. The holiest sites within, within Orthodoxy are located in that specific land. But we refer to that land as Palestine, which was the historic name that was given to it as a Roman province, as an Ottoman province. You know, even if you can see maps in, in the 1940s, you can see Truman, who was president at the time, standing in front of a map that says Palestine. So that's the way that we refer to it, because obviously the church is Israel. So we're not going to apply the name Israel to a to a, a modern state. So as far as us, mm. from, from an Orthodox perspective, I mean, you look at what happened to the Orthodox Christian population in Palestine after the after the Jews took over. They only owned 6% of the land in 1948. And then much of that was taken away from Christians. So there's all kinds of uh, videos that you can watch of Christians talking about how they were bombed, uh, Mm -hmm. how they were attacked, how how they were forced out of their villages and how they had to flee. And that was just the Christians, never mind the the Muslims as well that were were targeted. And many of the Muslims that actually are in Gaza now are in Gaza because they're either themselves if they're old enough or their ancestors were pushed into Gaza out of what we refer to now as Israel proper. What Americans need to understand about Israel is there is a war going on inside Israel between the more liberal kind of secular Jews kind of represented by the European Jews, primarily their historical uh, kind of more liberal mindset and very, very serious uh, Jewish radicals who want to refound the greater kingdom of Israel. Yeah, you know, sometimes in some of our articles, we publish a map that they put out, which shows parts of Syria, Lebanon, Egypt also being incorporated into a greater Israel. They want the temple back. They want animal sacrifice back. They want to cleanse Israel of all Christians. They want to cleanse this land of all Christian monuments. They openly talk about when we no longer need assistance, when we are powerful enough, we will knock all the churches down. They, this is a very dangerous group of people. They use Old Testament language to justify everything that they do. And they are not interested in cooperation. They are the perfect vehicle to hand you an antichrist. Well put. How how are Christians treated uh, in Israel, broadly speaking, now in the state of Israel? I've heard various uh, things from from people from Orthodox clergy, let's say, that have been there, mm-hmm. and then you hear stuff on I don't know. Now I feel like I'm, I'm setting it up to be, to be too obvious from like media and stuff. Like, oh no, it's it's basically like America how we treat Christians. How are they treated there? Well, in America, we're not getting spit on in the streets yet, but right. uh, you are getting spit on. Christians are getting spit on in the streets. You've had uh, a lot of land stealing going on. Uh, so the Armenian Armenian church was broadcasting pleas for help because they were using uh, 
bulldozers to knock down historic or median sites because they want to take the property underneath it. And mm. so it really comes down to this, okay? So if you're living inside Israel proper and you're an Arab or a Christian, then depending on what you do for a living and uh, other variables, you may be okay. You may have a decent life. Uh, if you live in one of the occupied territories, that would be Gaza, because we have Christians in Gaza and their church mm -hmm. was bombed. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have Christians in the West Bank. In the occupied territories, you're, being, you're facing ethnic cleansing, you're facing land seizures, you're facing being cut off from your own uh, vineyards and your own olive groves if you happen to be a traditionally a farmer. It, life is brutal. You're under occupation. You're being attacked not only by the official forces, but you're being attacked by various militias that there's no punishment for. And so that's why the patriarch of Jerusalem, our patriarch of Jerusalem, said that he felt that Christianity in Israel, in that whole area of the Palestine, the West Bank, Gaza, within Israel proper, it was his feeling that our existence was under threat. Mm -hmm. our very existence. And so also the patriarch of Antioch uh, mm -hmm. put out put out regularly that he feels that both Palestinian Christians and Palestinian Muslims um, need rights. They should be protected and they're not being protected. It, it feels to me, and I'll let you comment on this, that because of just how things go in America, there's this false dialectic where especially pertaining to the events going on over there right now, if you, if you criticize what the state of Israel is doing, it's like, oh, then you like Muslims or you like terrorism. Um, talk about, let's say, maybe a royal path and not necessarily, because you see these protests, which I think mm -hmm. some of them could be, um, let's say, funded and staged. It's on some level. I don't know. That's just a feeling I get. But, the, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, we're against what's what the state of israel is doing to people but it doesn't mean like oh i'm i'm, I'm pro-palestine and i and i'm pro-hamas do you see that kind of dialectic being set up here to kind of push the the like nuanced argument out oh yeah but we we see that dialectic all across the board if you're opposed to funding funding ukraine you want yeah. peace negotiations in ukraine right. because you want you want the war over because ukraine is has been destroyed Ukraine has been depopulated. The economy is a complete wreck. They've lost 600,000 soldiers, a, a whole generation of men gone. We need peace. But of course, if you call for peace, then you're pro-Putin. So it's the same thing here. If you, if you criticize what's going on in Gaza, if you criticize the fact that Israel does not give full citizenship rights to non-Jews, if you criticize the fact that, uh, that Israel is occupying the West Bank and Gaza, which should not be occupied, and the, the occupation is, is horrible, it's brutal. And it's so brutal, in fact, that Israeli soldiers have refused to deploy to the West Bank. Forget Gaza. They've refused to deploy to the West Bank because they don't want to be part of it. Um, but if you criticize that, well, then you're pro-Hamas. Right. Okay, great. But what about the West Bank where Hamas isn't in charge? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's the PLO. Well, the PLO actually has Christian ministers that serve in that government because the PLO is officially a secular. The Palestine uh, Liberation Organization was founded as a secular anti-colonialist movement. So why, how, are, how am I pro-Hamas if I want to talk to you about what's going on at the West Bank? Oh, well, you just are because Americans, unfortunately, associate Hamas with everything Palestinian. Too mm -hmm. many Americans do. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, the, having a nuanced discussion in the United States is on any topic mm -hmm. is practically impossible uh, at this point because uh, something we've been talking a lot about at Orthodox Reflections is labels. Mm -hmm. They don't even debate the point. They don't even discuss what it is that you're, what you just said. Let's say you make a point in a discussion. They immediately flip around and go, oh, well, you're pro Hamas or they yes. label you as a, as a potential terrorist. Yes. That's the new buzzword, potential terrorist. You're a right. potential terrorist. Well, how about we discuss what I just said about a, a peaceful foreign policy in which we can cut our defense budget and apply that money to domestic priorities? Okay, well, now I'm pro-Putin and I'm pro-Hamas, just because right. I just said that. So the labeling has, has absolutely taken over, and we no longer actually debate or discuss anything. We just hurl invectives at each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's... Uh...
I, I, it does feel on some level though, uh, I, I saw a debate with Dennis Prager and a friend of mine, friend of the show, Dave Smith and, and a couple of others. And it does feel like there's this tension and I think we're winning, if you will, and not to create a dialectic here, but like kind of the boomer legacy media seems to be kind of dying out and in, in what I would call alternative media, even though in, on many levels, it's not alternative, it's bigger. But I mean, the the way things are researched and presented is an alternative method to, let's say, mm-hmm. more of the um, controlled mechanisms that have happened for decades. And here's a man, Jen, Dennis Prager, who's, and Dave Smith admitted this, been studying this issue of Israel, the state of Israel for 40 years. And here's Dave Smith, my buddy, who's a comedian and a libertarian podcaster who's studied it for, let's say, 10 years. And Dave absolutely destroyed him because this old legacy media type presentation of of the quote unquote facts, it's very, it's done in very buzzword talking points, accusations Mm -hmm. that if you're not with me, you're against me sort of thing. And all it takes is a more nuanced discussion to just kind of obliterate that. And, you know, I'm, I was biased. I was on the side of Dave Smith. Ironically, he's Jewish and, and pushing for a similar, uh, let's say, message that you and I would be pushing for in the conflict going on over there. Mm-hmm. Against Prager just said, Prager starts off the discussion with, uh, there's no difference, but the only difference between uh, what Hamas and Nazis is that Nazis uh, tried to hide what they were doing and Hamas is proud of it, let's say. And Dave Smith goes, that's the only difference you see is, well, Hamas, I, I can list a thousand differences. Hamas doesn't have an army. Uh, mm-hmm. th- there's no military. They're not backed by a government. Like, is that the only difference as you see is what you said? And he just picked him apart. And so I guess the hope that I see in things like that mm-hmm. are, in a way, the the alternative view and messaging and style of presenting facts seems to be winning as this old media legacy boomer media starts to die out. Do you see that? But again, though, what we're discussing with these laws, I, I think is a way to fight back against them losing this narrative. Those, those are all very good points. So I think, yes, if you think about who are the, the biggest podcasters right now, Joe Rogan and Tucker Carlson. Yes. They're massive. Yes. And what are they known for? sitting down and having in-depth conversations with people. Yes. Okay. Whereas before, uh, go back 20 years, it was mostly a guy yelling into a microphone about whatever it was that was upsetting him and his audience. Well, Tucker and, and Joe Rogan are leading the way towards these sort of nuanced conversations. And I do really appreciate the growth that that's having. But on, on, the, on the flip side of that, though, if you think about that hit piece that you mentioned on Father John Whiteford, the hit piece there and other hit pieces like it are all framed around buzzwords. Correct. White supremacist, um, you know, right-wing young men, uh, right-wing extremists. They never define any of that. No. None of that. They don't actually tell you what it is that Father John Whiteford is saying that really upsets them so much. They pack it full of these, these buzzword labels that whole purpose of which is just to activate some level of disgust reflex in the, the true believers who are reading the article. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're still stuck in that. And I, I hope that we continue to move forward with, with more civil and, and more cultured debate on real topics, real issues, really diving into this and really looking at the facts. But there is that element that's still going on. And, you know, and Prager, uh, not only is Prager aging, but you know, Prager runs his own university. Prager lives in, a, in an echo chamber. Mm. So that may have been one of the few times that he's been challenged in a long time. And mm-hmm. debating, debates are like every other, any other type of uh, reflex. If you don't exercise it, it yep. it's atrophy. Yep. So, um, and- and Dave Smith went in there. He's, it was a beautiful way he described this. Kind of almost, he said, I was kind of intimidated. I've heard Dennis Prager's voice for decades. And he said, I went in there like I was going to punch a brick wall and I'm ready for my fist to get hurt and possibly, possibly be bloodied. And just I'm just going to give it my shot. And he says, it felt like I went to swing 
here comes a brick wall. And I punched a screen door and it flew wide open. And he's like, I couldn't believe it. I, I could not believe I almost wanted an opponent and I felt like my opponent just laid down and I pinned him. So mm. uh, it was a fascinating debate. And I, actually for the people listening, I'm, I'm going to link to that because it was such a fascinating show of this legacy talking point buzzword thing, echo chamber, like you mentioned, mm. going up against someone who actually does r like prepare and, and study the issue and has the facts thinking, Maybe I'm going to get a, few, a little bit bloody here, but I'm going to present it. And it was just, it was fascinating. Um, we'll get, I'll get you out of here. Uh, any final thoughts just to kind of leave people with on, on the themes that we've been talking about in, in this piece in general? Well, I guess the, the biggest thing is those of us on who consider ourselves to be on the right side politically, who are traditional Christians, which orthodoxy is, is very, very morally and, and traditional. It's very easy for us to recognize threats to liberty that are coming from the woke. Yeah, you know, we all understand we can be canceled because we said the wrong thing about transgender. We understand now that if we misgender someone or we use the wrong pronoun, that HR is going to pay you a visit. We, we understand that there are things you just can't say in certain areas. Uh, we get that. But what we are not necessarily prepared for is the fact that the quote unquote right wing is not any better in terms of uh, a commitment to free speech. They also will shut us down. And that's being illustrated right now in real time. So no one, no one puts uh, riot police on the streets and shut down Antifa in the summer of love back in 2020, but they're putting, they're putting uh, riot police on campuses right now to bust up these demonstrations. Antifa mm -hmm. can go out and say that the white race should be extinguished. No one's going, no one's talking about controlling that speech. No one's going to deplatform the extreme left. But if you're saying that Israel should extend full citizenship rights, irrespective of religion, everyone should be treated the same. I mean, isn't that what we say here in, under our constitution that all mm -hmm. citizens are equal regardless of religion? Mm -hmm. How can you then turn around and justify having a state whose entire ethnic identity is tied up in one religion and they're the ones that have all the rights? Mm. Well, the right wing will shut you down over, over whatever charges of anti-Semitism. Those are capable of mutating into anything. Okay, because anything could be anti-Semitic if you decided to push the case. So Christian doctrine, anti-Semitic. Christian practice, anti-Semitic. And so this is extraordinarily dangerous. It's an assault on free speech. Everyone should see this. And there is absolutely no justification for this. And if you allow people to, to stampede you into thinking that, okay, if I speak out about this, I'm going to be labeled a Hamas supporter. Better to be labeled a Hamas supporter right now and explain your case and say, this isn't about Hamas. This isn't about terrorism. This is about free speech. This is about $27 billion of taxpayer money that is being expropriated from us and given to a foreign country. This is about us being dragged into World War III if we end up with a regional war in the Middle East. Uh, this is about all of these things, and you're trying to shut this conversation down by simply labeling us who want to have this conversation as anti-Semitic. And we can't allow that. If we go down this path, we will one day find out that we don't have the platforms or, that you're giving me right now, that you and I are having this discussion. We won't have the platforms. We won't have uh, freedom anymore. Mm. Well put. And, and groups like Orthodox Reflections are, are, are help, helping drive a more positive truth a message. One more time for people listening, plug away, uh, Twitter, uh, the website, anything you'd like. Well, sure. All our social media is linked on, on our website, uh, orthodoxreflections.com. Uh, please come by and visit. Our top, top story right now is on Yosemite Sam Orthodox. <laughs> uh, so we try to keep, we, we try to put some humor into it as well. Just if you've got to laugh sometimes, otherwise you'd cry. Yes. But uh, we, we cover a wide variety of topics and uh, please come by, orthodoxreflections.com. Excellent. Nicholas, thanks so much for being here once again on Counterflow, sir. Oh, thank you.
All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that. And I, there's going to be a lot of good clips from this one because there's a lot of misinformation. That's a good buzzword. A lot of propaganda out there that this episode can help cut through and uh, help teach some truths because there's a lot of heretical falsehoods out there right now, especially around this topic. As for this show, counterflowpodcast.com. Follow me on Twitter at Buck Rebel, B-U-C-K-R-E-B-E-L. Join our special group. You know what? I've got an idea for our special group this month. It's patreon.com slash counterflow. $5 or more per month gets you in our exclusive club where we have our once a month Zoom meetings, not published, not recorded. We are free to talk. And I think maybe I'm going to ask Nicholas to join us this month. Maybe we'll talk about this topic. I love this stuff and it answers a lot of good questions and he's wise. Maybe he'll show us his face in our private group. I don't know. I don't know if he can do that. I'll talk to him about this. And let's see, follow us on the YouTube page. Of course, subscribe on the YouTube page. And uh, until next week, you guys have a good one. We'll see ya. you. You get split in half, cause I call the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash a science with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Counterflow podcast? Our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.